Okay, so we, we, we will get started because we, I think there's a screening later uh, that we, we all, have to, all have to get to. So, so again, um, very, very quickly and um, uh, directly, I'm Romy Crawford. We're here at the Black Hearts Movement School Modality, the M Milan session at the Mudec Museum. Um, we've had morning sessions um, that have basically um, focused on uh, the, the Italian scene and um, those who, who identify uh, as black and, and artists, makers, activists, etc. And uh, in the afternoons, we are continuing uh, with the Black Arts Movement School modality, uh, uh, the US version and iteration. And so that's where we're picking up now. And our first presentation and session this morning um, is, is by Professor Steph Stefano Harney, the activist, the scholar, who spoke a little bit yesterday with one of his collaborators, uh, Fred Moten. And so Stefano, we'll, we'll move things to you. Thank you, Romy. Um, um, I'm very happy to be back. Um, thank you, Dia and Lashonda, as always. Um, I have about a half hour. I thought what I would do um, is revisit a little bit uh, what uh, Fred and I were discussing yesterday, and then maybe extend it into the contemporary uh, a bit. So it, it might be a little too ambitious, but but let me try and uh, you know uh, and see what I I can do. <clears throat> if you were here and recall. Yesterday, Fred and I were suggesting that the relationship between the uh, black liberation struggles, the black radical tradition, and the Italian radical traditions were not just uh, matters of uh, mutual inspiration or of solidarity um, or of uh, uh, international uh, relations, but they were entangled uh, periods of thought, that the, the very theory, the thinking, the development of kind of thought that led to action, the kinds of actions that led back to thought were, were, were intimately entangled in the late 50s and again in the 60s and into the 70s, uh, culminating, you might say, um, with, the, uh, with John Watson touring uh, Northern Italy with his film made by the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, finally got the news. Um, it's a deep imbrication with a lot of connections. And I, want, I thought it might be worth exploring a few of the, the key thoughts that run both through the Black radical tradition and through the Italian autonomous uh, and workerist tradition. And that indeed, um, uh, the Italian tradition draws on from from the black liberation tradition. Um, the terms I'm going to look at uh, are, are, are uh, once again, uh, Comrcerca, uh, co-research, refusal, uh, a term prominent in, in Italian uh, thought, but having a lot of roots in, 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 um, in the black radical tradition. Uh, exodus, which is a term that the Italians use, but of course resonates with anybody familiar with the, the black radical tradition, and mass intellectuality. I may get to a couple of others depending on the time. But where I want to start is, is a little bit somewhere else, and then come and see if those ideas can help us at all. Um, at the end of our talk last time, we talked a little bit about the other way that Italy and the United States are entangled. Uh, let's say, uh, rather than the way, rather than being our way, it's sort of their way. And here I mean the security states, the history of uh, of uh, military cooperation, uh, the history of of of, of uh, capital investment, et cetera, et cetera. As I said last time, uh, you know, there was nowhere in Europe that the U.S. was more worried about than Italy after World War II. And as a result, they, they did everything they can uh, to make sure that Italy followed, quote unquote, the, the, the capitalist path. Um, and that meant interfering in, in Italy's arts, it meant interfering in Italy's politics, interfering in Italy's economy, and it, interfering uh, in Italy's trade unions, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of entanglement has always been there. There's another thing, though, about the two places um, that, that warrant some, some, some thought. And that is, these are two countries where it's really hard to get people to recognize 
that both of these countries were colonial powers, right? We know the struggle in the U.S. to try to get the U.S. to admit it's a colonial power in the past and today. And this is also a struggle in Italy, you know. In Italy, you still can get people saying, well, no, yeah, sure, under Mussolini, et cetera, et cetera. But, but of course, in both cases, being colonial powers is, is, is integral to their in the entire life of the country, in the case of Italy, because it's such a new country, even before it was a country, right? Because the only thing it takes to be a colonial power, you know, in Europe is to be on the right side of the, of the Mediterranean. It doesn't matter how many lands you control formerly with your troops. It's unfortunate no one could explain this to Mussolini before he started murdering people all over the east of Africa because he thought somehow that Italy was not a colonial power. Of course it was a colonial power. It's European. What else could it be? The peoples of Italy, even before Italy was Italy, were deeply involved, as you know, from even from the, the bourgeois history books. You know, people like, like uh, Cristoforo Colombo, all the people who, uh, Italians who went to Portugal and were part of the Portuguese uh, uh, adventures and colonization, on and on and on, the financing, everything, right? Italy's always been a colonial power, and so is the U.S. from day one. Um, very hard to get either of these countries to, to talk about it. And they, so maybe it's not a surprise that one of the ways we've turned, it may be in frustration or maybe out of some hope, it is to this decolonial discourse. Right. Uh, at least if you say, you know, to a museum in New York, it's time to decolonize this, you, you're at least insisting that it must have, it must be colonial, right? And similar, uh, similarly, you know, we're seeing uh, in Italy uh, as well as in the rest of Europe, this turn towards the decolonial as a strategy. Uh, first of all, I would say it's a it's an education strategy, and maybe that's in some ways it's. Uh, most effective uh, uh, position, but also it's a it's a it's a it's a strategy of 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 trying to make change and wrest power away from uh, uh, powerful institutions. There's where I think you know we can maybe think a little bit about this entangled history of the Italian left and of uh, the black radical tradition to see. To see what we can get out of this decolonial turn um, that's taking place, you know, in the U.S., taking place in in Europe, taking place in a lot of places, right? It, you know, it's uh, it's it's a tricky proposition, the decolonial turn. I, I don't need to tell you, and I'm sure as you have thought yourself, you know, what what could it really mean to demand decolonization? There are a lot of problems with this that we have to work out. That's not to say it should stop us, but it's it's, it's worth trying to reflect on these things. First of all, uh, you know, um, this turn to, to decolonizing happens uh, at a moment when we have to confess that decolonization both never happened and, and did happen. And sometimes it's, you know, uh, both are problematic. So, for instance, in the region that, that I know best, that I'm closest to, in the Caribbean, it doesn't make any sense to, to, to talk about uh, a decolonized world because half of the, half of the places in the, in the Caribbean are still colonies. Uh, should we really decolonize the Whitney Museum before we decolonize Puerto Rico? Should we really decolonize, you know, uh, 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 galleries in Paris uh, before we decolonize Martinique, you know, or, or Curacao, or, or on and on, you know, the U.S. Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a weird way in which it seems out of time and out of place in that sense that there is so much of a colonized world still there. Similarly, we also have to look at the projects of decolonization themselves as they supposedly did occur. Um, and and ask some serious questions about um, what 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 was what wasn't achieved. Um, for instance, Fred and I often start with a formulation when we're talking about this, where we ask because we don't know the answer, but we think the answer is important. How is it that post-colonial political leadership delivered the anti-colonial movements 
into the hands of neocolonialism? How is it that post-colonial governments delivered the anti-colonial movement into the hands of neoliberalism, into the hands of neocolonialism? Was there something in those anti-colonial movements that presented uh, an opportunity for them to be exploited and redirected and blunted uh, and fooled and suppressed and all the things that happened to them in the transition to the post-colonial governments that we face today, whether we're talking about Modi's India or, or, or you know, um, the, the constant uh, re-emergence of, of fascist possibilities in Latin America. So it's a, it's, a, it's a term that already throws up as many problems as it does possibilities. And one of the places that, that I think it's really necessary to focus in that regard is uh, around C.L.R. James's very famous formulation that um, uh, it's it says senseless to talk about class without talking about race as it is to talk about race without talking about class and one of the ways that we can we can raise a question about the decolonial movements then and now uh, is around this question of the class of the of the decolonizers because what we saw persistently is a betrayal um, of the working class peoples of the anti-colonial movement um, by their middle class leadership. And of course, this makes us very wary when we turn and think of decolonizing institutions, museums, universities, academies, because the, the question arises, well, who's making these calls? for decolonization, what class positions do they occupy? And this is not a moral question, it's not a question of somebody failing to, to, to live up to standards, but how much can we expect without what I mean, Cabral called class suicide? Um, we didn't get that in most of the uh, anti-colonial movements, not successfully, not fully, for a whole number of reasons of repression and betrayal. Um, and as we turn now to think about the decolonial in Europe, um, I think it's worth having some of these questions in mind. And maybe some of these terms from the black radical tradition and from the Italian uh, uh, autonomous tradition can, can help us a little bit at this moment. So I want to set up a little kind of thought experiment. Uh, are we going okay with the... Uh, the, the the translation and everything. Am I being translated? Yeah, it's it's all right. Okay, because um, I can speak slower. Also, that I guess that's what I really meant to say. Um, let's uh, let's 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 go just from do just from a basic point of view, understand that the you know the black radical tradition has had as its 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 foe as its enemy. Uh, both capitalism and white supremacy. Uh, the the strategies it forms, the 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 creative ideas that are created are created in that in that fulcrum. The 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 Italian workers' tradition, of course, probably should have taken white supremacy uh, seriously, but its enemies tended to be to be uh, capitalism, of course, but also gradually the party and the union, the places that were supposed to be for them, right? Um, and, and if we, for a minute, substituted that and said, okay, well, what are we fighting right now when we fight the decolonial? Um, we could perhaps say, of course, we're still fighting the fight against white supremacy. We're still fighting a fight against capitalism. But now, are we also fighting a fight that is parallel to those Italian workers when they had to fight their own party, when they had to fight their, um, their, 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 their own uh, union? Very similar to if, you, if you've ever seen like, you know, uh, Blue Collar, the, the Paul Schrader film with, with Richard Pryor and Yafa Koto, right, and Harvey Keitel. 
they're fighting their own union, right? The League of Revolutionary Black Workers, they have to fight their own union, et cetera. So it's not just an Italian thing. But imagine that we substituted these things that are supposed to be for you, the party and the union, right? It's supposed to be, you know, for, for you, for us, right? In those circumstances. Obviously, we, weren't, we had to fight them. Uh, they're still not, you know, right? Whether you're talking about the Democratic Party in the United States or whether you're talking about, you know, PD or whatever's left in Italy, right? They're not, they're not for us, you know? Uh, nor, unfortunately, are most of the unions, right? But if we substitute that for, for, in our decolonial struggle, we'd say, well, what are those things, the party and the union? And I would say that probably the museum and the university or the museum and the academy, right? The art academy. Those are the things now that are supposed to be for us, right? They're, they're the things who are supposed to look after us. You know, they're, they're supposed to be, you know, the things that we want to work for us. Um, but maybe we should start to think of them um, as, as, in a sense, uh, our antagonists. Those, those organizations which we have to fight as fully as we can um, if anything like a decolonization project is to occur. Now, once again, I want to stress this is not personal. It's not about any particular institution, and it's certainly not uh, an attack on our, our, our current hosts in any way. It's a thought experiment about what it might mean for a, decol a decolonial uh, uh, strategy to be successful. And it seems that the first thing a decolonial strategy would have to do is it would have to find some way to escape the ways that these kinds of institutions, whether it's a party or whether it's a union or whether it's a museum or whether it's a university, recompose class all the time, creating divisions amongst us that are already there in all kinds of ways, including because of white supremacy, and um, and and blunt any efforts at 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 at. Uh, a, a, cell, a, a collectively self-actualized uh, life. Um, so I just want to take a minute to look at a few of the terms. Again, most of these you'll immediately feel the resonance with with uh, the black radical tradition that the Italians uh, introduced. For instance, uh, um, this term refusal, right, the, which also often goes as the refusal of work, right. Well. This wasn't refusal in the simple sense of you said, I, I don't want to work today or, or uh, you know, I hate this job, you know, it could be that. But what refusal really meant was a refusal of the idea that um, one found meaning or dignity through work. Right? It was a refusal of the idea that, that by being productive, that, um, that one um, had meaning, uh, you know, in their lives. Um, obviously, for people subjected to a history of enslavement and, uh, and oppression, the idea that the work they were forced to do was ever going to be a work of dignity, you know, didn't, didn't pop up so much, right? Refusal was built into the black radical tradition because, yeah, of course, it's not going to provide you with uh, the, the dignity that, uh, and fulfillment that that goes towards the improvement and productivity of this kind of a society. Um, but what would it mean to think about refusal in terms of uh, our, our work, whether if, if our work is connected to museums, uh, to, to, to art academies, to universities, to art galleries, et cetera? I, I leave that for a second while I just cover a couple of terms and then maybe we can come back and 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 sort of uh, I don't know answer that question. Um, another one, another term that comes out of the um, Italian tradition as a term, but will be again recognizable from the perspective of the of Black liberation struggles, is the term mass intellectuality. And this is a this is a term to indicate uh, in the Italian tradition that the 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 uh, the, the means of producing your life um, are, are sit with you. They don't sit with uh, a machine. They don't sit with a factory. They don't sit with a, they, they, they sit with our social capacities and they sit with our, our ability um, 
to 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 discourse and intercourse in 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 ways that build our 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 social relations with that term in mind the the italians also began to propose this term exodus uh, and the term exodus which you will be immediate, immediately familiar from the black radical tradition and which by the time it is introduced it would be impossible to imagine that it wasn't introduced as a as an influence from the black radical tradition Exodus combines sort of two things from the black radical tradition. It combines the notions of fugitivity, of, of petit marinage and marinage, and it also combines a, a, a more uh, a part of the prophetic tradition, right? That the, 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 the exodus of the people from out, out from bondage, right? When the Italians pick it up, one of the things that they are talking about is an exodus, an exodus from the factories. But they're combining it with some of these uh, other ideas like mass intellectuality and social factory, etc. To say that when we leave, we've taken everything with us. Because pretty much everything is, is, is us now. Now that labor has become so communicative, so, so much about um, uh, social interaction, so much about uh, the use of affect, so much about our cultural knowledges, so much about our artistic expressions, our, our, our attention, our, et cetera, et cetera. All of this resides with us. It's, it's not in a machine. Uh, it, it's not in a workspace. Uh, it's with us. So that when we leave, it's as if we stole all the machines because we are not just a factor in production, but, uh, you know, increasingly the entire means of production. And that meant, of course, a collapse uh, on, on behalf of those, uh, uh, those factories, etc., th that we leave from, that this exodus would produce all that we need. Um, again, this is part of a longer history of, uh, of worker suspicion of the, the original kind of left position was, was we take the factory over and we'll run it for ourselves and everything's gonna be fine, right? This idea that the technology is simply neutral, that, that um, somehow if I got a hand, my hands on it, I would do the right thing. But of course, the long history of places like the Soviet Union where supposedly we did get our hands on these machines makes you begin to see that, well, these machines weren't created in a neutral environment. They were created for the exploitation of labor. They were quick created to produce divisions of labor that divided people, et cetera, et cetera. Refusal, mass intellectuality, exodus, this notion that we get from Tronti that he definitely is echoing uh, CLR James when he says it, the workers first, then capital. The idea that, that workers' power, workers' organization, workers' action, forces capital to react. And when, when they're talking about that, when James is talking about it in terms of the workers throw up the organization that is necessary, or when he says all the organizing is done, probably pro really what they're, what, they're, what they're talking about in, the, in those moments is not, oh, then capital has to compromise, or then we make a deal, or et cetera. No, we're talking about uh, resting of power. So power sitting in the hands of workers, workers first, and capital having to find a way to steal it back. It's not a negotiation. It's not a matter of labor relations. It's, it's in a sense, a zero-sum game. The, the, it, either it stays with the workers or capital finds a way to take it back till the workers, once again, um, uh, call the shots. Um, I wonder if we thought about this bun these bundles of ideas, this entangled sort of black radical autonomia, uh, if we thought about from, from the point of view of the current struggles of, of the decolonial, um, would we in some ways have a different set of strategies and positions with regard uh, to, to the places that we call uh, to be decolonized, to museums, uh, art academies, universities, et cetera. Indeed, wherever we call it, curriculums, uh, wherever we call for the decolonial, would we have to begin to shift our strategy away from uh, these kinds of compromises and demands uh, towards forms of self-organization and, um, 
and and autonomous collective life, uh, in which in which case it ultimately wouldn't mean very much whether a museum or an art academy decolonized uh, or not. Um, so that's the question that I'm kind of posing for you and, and leaving with you. Is there a way that we can draw on this entangled history um, to, to, to think about our current struggles today in a way that would um, extract them from some of the contradictions and fraught histories um, connected, to, connected to the notion of decolonization? And I think this is most especially uh, important with regard to um, the, the question that Cabral raised of class suicide. Uh, we cannot let these institutions decolonize and at the same time uh, 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 recompose uh, our, our, our class divisions. Um, uh, and if we do, then we, we will most likely fail. So I leave you with that. Um, and I don't know, Romy, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're we're great for time. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, let's let's close out Stefano's um, presentation, and then um, you know, I, I think it's just incredibly timely that you brought this up. I have personally been in conversations with people as recently as yesterday, who where we were thinking about how to. Uh, to really uh, leverage uh, that idea of decolonizing, especially cultural institutions and museums, uh, you know, that, that sector of life, not uh, the, 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 the geographic trains you mentioned, how to do that in a, in a way that, that really uh, meets the project uh, that's on some of our minds. And we, we've been wary, so this is really, really incredibly um, timely in that way. Um, I think what we're do, we'll do, because we, you know, we have these two different sectors and we do have a little time at the end, and I think there may be some questions. Maybe we could have one question, if there is one, from the, the people that are in the room with me here, and then one, if there is one, from people that are, that are online um, before you take off or before you, you, we close out your session and go to Paul Miller. Um, sure. So is there anyone who has something that's in this room? And if not, if there's anyone who has something that's online, oh, we do, I knew the hands. Okay, so I think what we did yesterday, it was very impromptu, but the person just came on up. Is that gonna be Gaia? Are you gonna? <laughs> we have two, so we might try to take two of these. Yes, I think you can, because I think it'll translate. You tell me if it does. Okay, uh, the question is, uh, um, how much uh, the um, positionally ok lo faccio in italiano ok um, la domanda è quanto pensi che il posizionamento uh, anche nelle organizzazioni um, So the, the question, uh, it's a very complex question, um, is about the importance of positioning and positionality um, in relation to um, uh, movement. Movement. Autogestic. 
Uh, so self-organized uh, movements, um, how, how important the positioning and positionality is in regards to um, the self-organized movements uh, in even, e even within institutional uh, contexts um, in relation to colonial history, but also in relation to all of these um, cultural identities, essentially. You could have done it by yourself. <laughs> Sorry if it wasn't clear. Uh, thank you for that. That is a, a complex question. I think <clears throat> I think the way that I would like to to try to answer it though is is just to say that what we're pushing at here is is uh, is to understand all the ways that these institutions. Uh, um, not only uh, uh, take away our power and and stratify us and individuate us, but are 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 themselves so bound up with a um, a colonial legacy, uh, whether it's a museum in Italy or a museum in the United States or whatever else. All all of the all of the basic impulses of the colonial project, uh, improvement, productivity efficiency, uh, organization, finishing things, uh, product, you know, um, uh, uh, classification, these are all built so deeply into, into our institutions that it seems, it seems to us that it would be worth investing in the calls inside the black radical tradition and in Italian autonomia uh, to, to to recognize our history of ability to, to, to organize outside of these terms. And if that means, it also means we have to organize outside of these institutions rather than imagining we can decolonize them. Because maybe by the time you're finishing decolonizing a museum, there's nothing left. Maybe by the time you finish decolonizing a university, there's nothing there. You know, there's some paper blowing across the, the courtyard, you know. These institutions of the last hundreds of years, you know, were intimate to the project of colonialism. And if it's hard enough, you know, for, for Nigeria that was intimate for years to a colonial project as a, as a country, even to imagine itself outside of colonial structures, capitalist structures of, of power, it seems nearly impossible that we could expect this from a university or art academy or a museum. And yet we have this strong history of resources, strong history of thinking uh, in which we, we know that we're, we're first, you know, as, as James and Tronti said, you know, our organization comes first. We know how to do this. And, you know, when I say we, this is going to be a differential we in different circumstances and, and it's not a utopia in which problems of power would just disappear. Uh, but it seems to, seems to me almost a guarantee that these problems of power are going to continue if we imagine that we can, uh, that we can separate these institutions from their, 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 their colonial makeup. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we're running out of time, but uh, Marina, did you want to, you can quickly. In the Just very, very quickly. I think that uh, uh, this school, which uh, Rami has uh, established and exactly what we're doing right now is a form of strategy which goes beyond the academia or you know the official one and uh, personally I don't believe you can decolonize uh, colonial institutions but probably you can act uh, with some strategies and I do believe this is uh, a very you know excellent example for it thank you well you know one of the things that came up this morning and in, in you know Stefano and I have, have had conversations and talked about these things in the past but but, you know, I think when you said letting the thing go or, you know, uh, not finishing, you know, these, 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 these kind of petite projects that are part of these institutions are the things that we could re recompose and reorganize. You know, it seems ridiculous to say finishing something or turning something in on time or whatever they are, that those structures are, are the, thing that, the things that need to be bended a bit, but actually they are. And it feels really illegal and illegitimate and unproductive and 
um, you know, you won't be promoted necessarily if you do these, but these are these are some of the logics that I think are, are really important. The other thing that came up this morning that I think relates, so I'm just going to bring it up, and, and it came from one of the, 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 the Black Arts Movement practitioners that's in the room with us this, you know, this uh, week, Robert Earl Page, who reminded about, you know, that, that racism uh, has a different model every year. And so that tells us too that you know we've got to constantly recompose, constantly reorganize. Um, and so, so the project of BAM School is, of course, ready to ready to let go, ready ready to disappear, ready to to move in another space always. Um, and even finding itself in an institution like this doesn't mean that it always sits in these kind of locales because that is something as a practitioner and maker who really does take its take my cues from the black the radical black tradition um, and other other traditions of radicality, I am open to, to those projects of letting go, letting the thing disappear, wilt, you know, moving on to the next thing, taking the next iteration. So that's the real piece of it that I, I think is, is I'm, I try to platform. All I can say is bravo. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And so we're going to, um, as we do with these sessions, uh, thank you so much, Stephanie. And so we're going to continue in, in this vein of the day of, of, of people who are interested in, um, in, in activisms and, and Paul Miller, um, a.k.a. DJ Spooky, um, uh, also somebody I've been in, in communication with and conversation with, you know, over a long time ultimately, you know, works in so many genres that, that, that uh, he stays really fluid as well, I think in a way that, that is instructive for us as a composer, as an artist, as a DJ. Um, the work not only blends genres, but he's also, you know, somebody who's a real proponent and producer of global culture. He kind of thinks globally and acts globally and, 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 and also uh, projects that, that intervene, connect to the environment and, and social issues. So um, another, another take on some of the same material. So Paul? Um, first of all, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, just, can you just sort of say hey or? Yes, we can. Oh, can you yes, hear me? Can. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, well, here we are in 2023. Um, I'm in a small town called Sag Harbor, just outside of New York. So it's, um, it's been a really fascinating, you know, uh, cycle of things to think about the black arts movement in the context of the 21st century. And so I just want to say thank you, Romy, for uh, convening this and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me dive in. Um, first and foremost, just for background, uh, I just want to say Italy. Uh, I've been to Italy many times and I've DJed there and spent quite a significant amount of time throughout the, the country. And to me, at least, the intriguing thing about our moment is the rise of both authoritarianism on one hand, which is actually harkening back to certain issues, one could argue, with Italy as a current a sort of DNA of some of these things, uh, whether it be the Romans or whether it be the rise of uh, fascism. And then on the other hand, some of the more avant-garde critique of how people thought about the acceleration of culture, obviously with the Italian futurist, particularly Luigi Russolo and his idea of the arte, uh, of arte di rumore, or the art of noise. So what I want to do today is kind of riff with you guys about a couple of projects and initiatives that I think will be resonant with the conference that Romy has convened, but also to kind of give points of entry into a conversation about this idea of deterritorialization uh, that I think are really complicit in the global uh, financial models of how social media is reconfiguring the conversation in the era of mass media, mass surveillance, and above all, the sort of eerie, uh, for lack of a better, uncanny effects of social media on the idea of identity and consciousness itself. So if we can call up the first slide. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to walk you guys through a project called Quantopia, which simply stands for Quantified Utopia. And I'm intrigued with this idea right now that we live in a world of numbers and we always have, we just didn't admit it. Um, now, when I say didn't admit it, the human mind is always putting together pattern recognition. So when we're thinking about art, science, philosophy, aesthetics, linguistics, those are essentially just all patterns. And if you begin to really think about the way the human mind in the 21st century is 
being put under immense pressure from the viewpoint of subjectivity and its relationship to everything from TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, you're, bit, you're seeing an essential reconfiguration of how we think about modalities of subjectivity. So if you think your, your body ends at the edge of your skin, you might wanna think again. Um, from my perspective, um, and this is based on a couple of books that I've been working on. And in fact, I'm currently working on a book called Digital Fiction, The Future of Storytelling. And that's gonna be with Duke University Press coming up in a bit. Um, so I'm beginning with Quantopia. It's barcodes superimposed on the flower of life, which is a sort of a mathematical configuration. Um, and I use this as the poster for the project, but I thought it'd be a nice point of entry into the conversation because you guys are at a museum and I'm sitting here in a garden. And to me, museums have always been kind of mausoleums of culture. There were culture, uh, objects are taken out of circulation. They're taken out of the, the social matrices that give them a, an embodiment in the culture. And above all, there are places where class and social hierarchy have created this notion of an ossified uh, status-based hierarchy of collecting and, and scarcity. So from my perspective as a digital media artist, it's the opposite. We live in the era of data. We live in an era where there's infinite play and there's every possible particular platform for creativity uh, erupting out of this sort of collision between data and society. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, I'm artist in residence currently at Yale University. Yale has a new department called the Center for Collaborative Arts and Media. And I just wanted to kind of invite you guys to check it out when you ever have a moment. Um, we're very friendly. It's a new building on the campus. Uh, feel free to dip in. It's, it's called collaborative media for a reason, arts and media, because we firmly believe in the conversation um, as a dialectical process between the arts. Uh, when I say conversation, I don't just mean, you know, people talking, but actually the creative and collaborative context that makes um, the dialectical process evolve. And um, so, yeah, I'm there, one of their first artists in residence. And I just wanted to kind of begin the conversation with that invitation for you guys to check us out. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so language. I'm always intrigued with pattern recognition as a foundation for a data-driven society. And as we move further into the 21st century, um, I always felt that this, it would be fun to kind of present some linguistic tropes that I felt were kind of resonant with the conversation about black arts. And you'll note, by the way, I haven't begun with, you know, a definition of what is black art or who is black for that matter. But I want to begin with a book that's currently banned. It's called If I Ran the Zoo by Dr. Seuss. Now, amusingly enough, this is the first place where the term nerd is used in English. And amusingly enough, the zoo and uh, Dr. Seuss, he was actually quite political. And he did a series of projects against, um, there was a movement literally in World War II called America First, which guess what? Here we are in 2023 with Trump. And it's eerie how fascism moves in patterns that one could argue based on psychological fragility, the idea of economy or economic instability, and above all, the notion of um, mass culture and the notion of victimhood. So um, say, for example, a white supremacist in America feels that they are the victim. Somehow society is against them. And if, uh, if only the blacks and the Jews and the gays and everyone would get out of their way, they could be make America great again. By the way, that was another phrase that he went against in World War II. So the make America great and also the America first movements were proto-fascist and they were against letting the uh, Jews come to America as refugees. They also were against any support for um, the war effort against uh, the fascist regimes. So Dr. Seuss began these illustrations and eventually he made this kind of quirky zoo book, uh, which is, if you have a moment, it's quite uh, intriguing. But here we are in an era where it's now ultra PC and the book is, is actually banned because the people say that it doesn't represent people of color um, in such a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's caricatures, it's all sorts of stuff. Now, intriguing enough, the creature, the nerd creature <laughs> in the book is became a popular trope. And eventually there's two terms that I'm gonna kind of riff on here, geek and nerd. And one was from a children's book that's currently banned. And the other one is taken from this idea of a literary scenario where people were unsure about information, but I'm gonna leave geek to later. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. This is uh, me DJing Earth Day. We usually have um, quite a large uh, audience. That's me DJing uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, 
and basically I, I had just gone to Antarctica a little while ago and I took a series of uh, what I call acoustic portraits of ice and it ended up making uh, kind of a series of sound art pattern recognition pieces. I then took that and made it into electronic music and we had the, one of the concerts, it was me, this band, The Flaming Lips, uh, The Roots, uh, you know, some of them are more popular, some are more avant-garde. But the idea is that Earth Day, uh, this is just a, a couple of years ago, I just thought I'd show you this picture because it's, it's a, one of the same places where Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. And for me as an artist, it's always intriguing to see how there's a very famous phrase that history um, often doesn't repeat but rhymes, you know, whatever one wants to say about that one. But the idea that DJing and having electronic music respond to the climate crisis in the same place that where Martin Luther King would have had his I Have a Dream speech is kind of an, an eerie parallax view or remix of the, the politics of perception and the crisis uh, that the climate is presenting us as we move further into what now scientists are calling the Anthropocene era. So if we can get the next slide. Okay, considering we're talking about rainbows as one of the themes, I wanted to give you a sense of how science and art overlap. And this is something that my book is gonna be engaging with quite a bit. By the way, my previous books are with MIT Press, which is generally considered one of the top um, art theory um, publishing houses in America. So, okay, James Clerk Maxwell, he's generally considered one of the most influential scientists of the 19th century. And amusingly enough, one day he was working on a series of projects where he wanted to separate colors. And he was, he'd been exploring works with electromagnetism and he separated red, green, and blue, and then recombined them. And he noticed one of the, the captured uh, photographs of it actually came out with these colors. And so from the exploration of science and the exploration of separating colors and then recombining them, you get the invention of what we now call color photography. So intriguing enough, as a scientist, obviously this is something of interest to him, but he went on to do stuff like, oh, helping Einstein create the general theory of relativity. And I always chuckle about the fact that photography was an afterthought to his experiments in light electromagnetism. But considering we're talking about rainbows, rainbows are made of a spectrum that is perceived in the eye. The eye then recombines the colors and the brain you know, has electromagnetic, electromagnetic chemicals and interactions. And eventually that becomes information that our consciousness can absorb. So amusingly enough, here we are in the 22nd, 21st uh, century here. And Obviously, every screen around you is an afterthought to James Clerk Maxwell. Every pixel you're engaging with, uh, the internet itself that we're using. Einstein actually went on to later on say he stood on the shoulders of James Clerk Maxwell. And one could argue that uh, fiber optic cables that hold the internet together, which route light um, and use fiber optics to create uh, the data networks that hold our global economy together. A lot of that comes out of this quirky experiment that combined photography and physics. So I always chuckle about that as a kind of, um, for lack of a better word, an interrogation of the role of art and science, going back to this idea of natural philosophy. So if you think about the black arts movement, one of the first people to really coin the term, obviously, is Amiri Baraka. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, now, Amiri Baraka is resonant with this particular image because he did a series of poems looking at the origins of alternative views of philosophy coming out of Islam, coming out of Buddhism, Hinduism. But what most people don't know is that our numbers are taken, considering you guys are in Italy, this might be of interest for you. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Fibonacci and he took uh, Arabic numbers from a gentleman by the name of al Qurizami. And amusingly enough, the Italians couldn't um, pronounce his name correctly. So eventually became the term algorithm. So he's a Muslim philosopher in the House of Wisdom in uh, ninth century Baghdad. And what's interesting about him is that he transposed um, Hindu uh, Sanskrit numbers and into Arabic numbers. And then Fibonacci, the Italian uh, explorer and mathematician came back and copied those and bought them to Europe. And he wrote a book called Liber Abaci, which amusingly enough, these are numbers that we now use, again, holding the entire frame of zeros and ones together that we call the internet, but also our math structures and so on. And so when you start to think about the black arts movement, we need to really update the idea of ethnicity, identity, and all the idea of global relationships to how we define consciousness and identity in the 21st century. And I wanted to kind of riff with Al Kurzami. He also, by the way, invented the term Al Derebra, uh, which again, amusingly enough, the Europeans didn't know how to pronounce it. 
So algebra is just a kind of a, a bad pronunciation of his name. You have algorithm and algebra. So, um, you know, I'll give a toast to Al-Qurizami. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so Gottfried von Leibniz is generally considered one of the main philosophers of the rise of artificial intelligence. Now, one thing you guys might have noticed is that here we are talking about blackguards, rainbows, and I'm talking about data, numbers, and some of the ethnic and philosophical systems underpinning how we think about identity and numbers. So, for example, I just showed you a Muslim Arab philosopher who appropriated Sanskrit numbers and created our uh, symbols that we call numbers now, uh, Arabic numbers. Amusingly enough, the idea of zero was banned by the Pope at the time because they felt it was the number of the devil. And for a while, um, this is what popes used to do. They would burn you at the stake if you were Galileo or Copernicus or, for that matter, Johannes Kepler. All sorts of interesting folks were threatened with being burned um, because they said the earth circled the sun or because they said that zero is a number of infinity and multiplicity. In India, they took it in a different direction and went for this idea of the multiverse, infinite universes. So zero was a concept that essentially it created this idea of a multiplicity of identities. So Gottfried von Leibniz, amusingly enough, was both a philosopher and mathematician. And he's generally um, the person who invented what we call calculus. And he was a competitor to Newton. Now, you guys will note, I'm going to be talking about black arts in the context of digital culture, but I want to give you a little bit of thought tools for the beginning of the conversation. And Leibniz created a, a philosophy of in, infinite multiplicity and multiple universes, multiple worlds, but he also felt that every aspect of knowledge would be calculable. So he's generally considered the first philosopher of artificial intelligence, but he was also very deeply interested in music. And from my perspective, from this quote, he's saying, music is the pleasure the human mind experiences from counting without being aware that it's counting is a good point of entry into the conversation about the black arts movement, data, and the digital dialectic that we now call home. If we can get to the next slide, please. Okay, I'm, considering you guys are in Italy, I thought it'd be fun to do a little Italy-centric situation. This is a map of Imola. It's a, it's a town in Italy, and it's a map done by a gentleman who you, you all in Italy probably are well familiar with, Da Vinci. Now, he was asked, by a certain Italian duke to come up with a battle map, a map that the, the army would be able to get into the town and invade. Um, and amusingly enough, this particular duke um, created what we like to think of as one of the early systems of our collection. And Imola, this is what you call an exonometric representation. And intriguingly enough, because da Vinci was um, kind of a, you know, under the patronage of the Medici and so on. Guess who these dukes are? You can, your guys are Italy. So I'm sure you know, are well familiar with this, but I want to tie this to technology. And again, tying it back to black arts and here's why. So if you have an axonometric representation, this is a satellite image before satellites existed. Essentially, you were not able to think of the city from above because you didn't have um, the overview effect of the idea of how to look at this as a representation be able to actually accurately draw the streets, accurately draw all of the um, uh, connecting routes and so on. So he came back to the Duke and said, here's a map. And the Duke was like, what is this? How, how are we supposed to work with this? And so he said, you have to imagine yourself moving through the streets in a different dimension, two dimensions, whereas this is a three dimensional representation. So if we can fast forward to, uh, to the next slide. This is this Imola from a satellite GPS map. And you can easily see how eerily accurate da Vinci was, but he didn't have satellites. And of course, he certainly didn't have GPS, which simply means global positioning satellite images. But he was an artist and he was able to imagine the overview effect before satellites even existed. So from 1502 to 2023, the, the relationship of the arts and technology is a very deeply nonlinear dialectic. And intriguingly enough, from our perspective, here we are, you guys are at the Museo del Couture, I'm fascinated with this idea that the arts gives us the linguistic and pattern recognition tools for patterns that we're not aware of yet. Things that we are trying to imagine that we can't imagine because we don't have the language or the math to imagine it yet. So that's what the black arts movement is to me. And it's giving us a sort of a potentiality, a future space that we are having one foot in this notion of infinite potentials of the multiverse as Sun Ra like to call it. But also from the viewpoint of math, art and science, the imagination is the ultimate renewable resource. 
we're always renewing, recalibrating, regrouping, and above all, hitting the reset button on how we think about the world around us. And I thought because of that, Da Vinci would be a good point of entry into the Black Arts Movement. Uh, you could also say maybe he was a proto, uh, uh, proto uh, prototype for this idea of natural philosophy and the arts. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. I'm giving people credit because, again, I really want to get you guys into the sense that I have a very expansive view of the Black Arts Movement. This is a very, very white person. <laughs> Her name's Ada Lovelace, um, but she's generally considered to be the first uh, software programmer. And again, she's never really given enough credit, but she commissioned a gentleman by the name of Charles Babbage to create what they called a difference engine. Now, the reason I'm bringing her up is because as a woman at the time, mathematics and the idea of women were obviously really not that uh, celebrated. I guess you could say the same thing is going on with the Taliban in Afghanistan, but hey, this was Europe. So I guess progress. Um, but amusingly enough, um, she got an education, got into math and started thinking about systems, structures and patterns. So uh, we can go to the next slide. This is considered a kind of a schematic of early software. And uh, this is uh, Babbage's uh, calculating engine that was based on her ideas and notes and software. Now, here we are talking about the black arts movement. And the reason I wanna kind of riff with you on this idea of software as a cultural artifact is that well, you have to imagine that here we are, we're in a world of software. But even just a couple decades ago, being a computer was an occupation and not a product. And generally it was made by black women. So if you look at NASA, for example, there was a film called Hidden Figures recently uh, Janelle Monet was in it, really good film, really interesting, where it showed rooms filled with black women doing math to calculate the um, trajectories of various rockets, uh, satellites, and so on. And obviously, once they were able to automate that with computers, not being the person, but computer being the product, um, the term computer actually switched linguistically to become a product instead of a person. So imagine if, if you were in the 1940s and 50s and you say, hey, we need a computer you would go to a room that would generally be filled with women and you'd give them the equation that you needed to have done and the women would come back with the solution of the equation. Uh, you, in Europe during World War II, there were rooms filled mostly with white women in England. Um, in America, it, it kind of went in a pivot mode with NASA and the space program um, and so on. But generally it was mostly women doing this kind of work. And I find it fascinating from Ada Lovelace to Hidden Figures, the movie, there's a nice trajectory again of both women at the hidden dimensions of what's going on with computer and digital media, but above all, from the viewpoint of the arts, giving people tools for things that they didn't even know existed yet. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is kind of a similar situation where they've calculated out, um, amusing enough, this would be done with uh, what they call their Bernoulli uh, kind of calculation engine. And amusing enough, there's another women's angle here. And the reason I'm, as a person of color, African-American, it's really important to me to show you guys the hidden dimensions of computation. And there were people of color. I, like I was saying earlier, you saw the gentleman by the name of Al Kurazami. You saw Ada Lovelace. This is a kind of a calculation table. And amusingly enough, Bernoulli, again, we're, we're, I'm kind of remixed this guys uh, for Italy here. But amusing enough, there was another person named Jacquard. And they had um, uh, the Jacquard loom. And that was the first place that uh, fabric was able to be calculated and they would run fabrics and uh, materials through machines that were calculated out. And you were able to have more and more of a complex uh, factory approach to fashion. And so I'm using of math and fashion, uh, what you're seeing here with the Bernoulli calculations run through the Babbage engine based on Ada Lovelace software. The sweater I'm wearing is essentially just a math pattern and somebody ran a software, the machine uh, wove it together same probably with every piece of clothing that you're wearing. So we still owe her a, a, a level of gratitude. And I just thought that would be a nice uh, thread to tie into the conversation. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Well, this is the same thing, you know, um, this is a software design called Ubuntu. And amusingly enough, I, I, ch I chuckle over the fact that Ubuntu, uh, one of the most popular languages on the computer culture that we use every day is Linux, it, but it was actually named after a guy named Linus Torvalds. And uh, Android, for example, and iOS are still kind of forks in the road of uh, the software. So I just wanted to show you from that one slide to our current 
kind of situation um, to give you a sense of the evolution of things. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes here because I'm very interested in, in the environmental arts movement as well as its intersection with the black arts movement. And Richard Feynman is generally considered one of the top uh, early quantum physicists in the 20th century, but his shadow lingers over the conversation. And here's why. Uh, nature, um, as we experience it, is under siege by human activity. That's why scientists are calling our time the Anthropocene era. Museums are essentially artifacts of that conversation with the Medici, uh, the scarcity, the class, the social hierarchy, being able to pull objects out of circulation for a hierarchical status um, presentation. But physics moves you in a different direction. And one could argue that physics overall is the language of the subconscious human, the architecture of our minds as we perceive four dimensions around us, but we occupy multiple other dimensions. And so from my perspective, going back to the beginning of this conversation where I was calling it quantopia, meaning quantified utopia, here we are. One could argue that the balance between nature and human is still eerily in flux. Like humans are not outside of nature. We are part of nature. And amusingly enough, uh, the term Ubuntu for software was essentially taken as, a, as an African indigenous language, <clears throat> but then reapplied to software. And I use that as a kind of a pun here about moving between nature as a kind of systems of thinking, uh, the ID, AKA natural philosophy, mathematics, and then nature as the West has reimagined it as this disassociative context that's we're now toxically destroying with plastic, fossil fuels, urban uh, sprawl and overpopulation. Um, so, so I love this phrase, nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. See, he could easily be a black woman at the Jacquard loom <laughs> in a different time. If you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is my family. Um, and I know we're here tight for time here, but I just wanted to say my father was Dean of Howard University's Law School in the 70s, and he was heavily involved with uh, many of the legal aspects of the civil rights movement. Uh, and my mother was a historian of design. Uh, her book, Threads of Time, 500 Years of Women Designers, inspires my work quite a bit. So both my parents were into social justice issues, philosophy, design, and above all, you know, uh, a happy African-American family. We weren't bitter, angry. We had a nice house. I went to a nice school. And I always feel like, you know, the issues around how we think about black arts always needs to be recalibrated because of the American experiment with democracy. And so we are kind of the underlying architecture of this very flawed uh, data-driven world uh, from the viewpoint of how the arts gives us these new tools for reimagining what is possible. Um, it's 1040, so I want to be respectful of time. Um, there's plenty more slides and I could easily go because this is a uh, talk that I had set up, but I just wanted to give you guys a quick taste of some of the issues I think are grappling with the Black Arts Movement. Um, and that is me in 1972. You can tell because me and my dad have the, a big collar. <laughs> um, so, Romy, how are we for time? I just want to be respectful. It's 1040. Yeah, we're, here. We're, we're good for time, but maybe we could take some questions, Paul, and then we'd be, be right on time. We have time for about two questions and then in the next session. Okay. And Thank by the way, that's you. Washington, D.C., 1972. So, yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. All right. Yep. And you know, we can do just um, as we did for the last session, we can ask if there are any questions from the room or, or virtually. Is there anything? Don't be shy, it's all good. I mean, yeah. It's a beautiful spring day here yeah. in Sag, Sag Harbor. <laughs> and then Dio, you, you can let me know if there's anything from online. I mean, you know, definitely there's been this sort of reverb um, in, in some of this, uh, uh, people asking us to, to think about yesterday, Linear Graham, you know, ended his uh, session with a lot of discussion about primal consciousness um, and, and sort of helping us to get to, to, to think about some of that. Um, I think your interest in the natural environment is, is very much uh, 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 reflected in the Rainbows exhibition that's at this museum. There, there are a few, few aspects of the show that, you know, point us in the direction of nature and the environment as the, the kind of starting place for some of this. 
think we've been trying to think about our common humanity, you know, kind of, and I think you always do this in your work and your practice. You really do push people to think in, in the most complex ways about, um, about identity formation, you know, it's never, it's never flat. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, those are just some of my comments, but is there anything that anyone wants to ask or say? Yep, we have something, or we have two, Paul. So. Okay. We do this in this odd way where people run to the front, just. Okay. Wait, we're going to have Guy ask. Uh, sorry, hi, I'm Gaia. Uh, the question is, so what do you think about, uh, if you know him, uh, Bayo Komolafe, that um, was uh, in Milan uh, last days and was talk about uh, post-activism, like uh, um, a way to um, intend uh, the um, post-human uh, way to to live, and it was uh, connected even uh, to ecological way, because um, he um, find in the Yoruba culture um, that um, does not mean the um, identity and ecology is like uh, two different um, identity, but uh, one in um, one in the same moment. And um, he thinks um, he let us reflect uh, about uh, um, the entanglement uh, um, by quantistic point of view. Um, and I want to ask you if um, you think that this uh, theory of uh, movement, even in physical way, uh, can be uh, understood by the internet uh, uh, word because uh, I think that mm, new physics um, and um, new technology um, had to um, find a new answer in the neurolog neurological aspect and uh, I has to you as a, a formator about this uh, these topics. What do you think uh, about this? Um, if you know by Akumul Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's an intense question. Uh, it's like why the universe? Um, okay. Let me uh, let me unpack. I think of some different threads from that. One, you were talking about Yoruba. And so amusingly enough, um, a lot of West African, there's a gentleman by the name of, uh, <clears throat> it basically has a book called African Fractals, Ron Eglash. If you haven't heard that book, it's really cool because he shows indigenous um, sub-Saharan African mathematics, really smart, really interesting, and fractals. And he was fascinated with how like uh, every, a lot of sub-Saharan African culture had a tremendous amount of fractals. And so he did a series of re uh, research about, if you look at like kente cloth, if you look at other, indigenous weaving patterns, they actually have quite a bit of mathematics in them. So he was very really intrigued. If you go to Brazil, you can also see indigenous um, weaving. So he, it, the book is just, it's, it, if you ever have a free um, moment, uh, just I highly recommend it. it's called African Fractals. Now, um, fractals are a kind of what you call Mare set. And so I'm using a patterns are just essentially uh, structures that we kind of engage with. So a human cannot live without patterns. Your heart is a pattern your breathing is a pattern, your walking is a pattern, but these patterns can be changed and we always can change anything. That's what's so amazing about the human mind. It's called neuroplasticity. And eerily enough, this is my own personal working theme right now while I'm working on the book that I'm finishing, is that it's harder to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. And capitalism has a very implicit psychological architecture and it's fundamentally based on scarcity, but it's also based on this idea that you know, accumulation and above all, uh, sort of dis disembodiment of production. So uh, what Marx would call alienation. So eerily enough, here we are in the 21st century where we're in a world with data around us at every level. How does art interact with this invisible and coercive architecture of capitalism? Well, there's one, the fetish of objects. Uh, most museums still fetishize a collection of physical goods. There's also the emotional context of how people think about 
the art as a kind of an emblem of, of uh, collection, social hierarchy, finance, and above all, uh, making sure that your collection is a reflection of, again, scarcity. But eerily enough, digital culture is about complete infinite copies that would automatically, in economics, that would bring it down to zero because everyone can have a copy of something. Oh, then you have NFTs. And which, by the way, are kind of a, a joke to me. I, I, again, if anyone out there wants to argue about the value of NFTs, I'm happy to do that. But if you look at economic theory, it's, um, it's, you look at art as a kind of a, a, a reception or a deposit of social value. And eerily enough, the, the economics of our data culture are paralleling the economics of art. So for example, market forces are based on perception. If you see a Basquiat painting, there's only a certain amount left. So those, again, market perceives that going up, the value goes up. Um, if you see, uh, you know, kind of a data-driven narrative going on, it would tend to the opposite because everyone would be able to have copies of that. Thus, it's not scarce. Thus, your value falls to zero. Economics is based on certain ideas of accumulation and scarcity. From my perspective, the Black Arts Movement, what was fascinating is that it gives people an architecture for a new approach to both the, the, the paradox of Europe and its place of the how African Americans were dehumanized. Now, amusing enough, African Americans in the Constitution were considered um, a fract, fragment of a human being. Um, it wasn't until the Civil War and the 14th Amendment uh, that later gave Ameri you know, African Americans a full identity as a person. Uh, so the slave owners, essentially, if you were in the South, you would, you would count three-fifths of your slaves as a person for both tax purposes. And so eerily enough, that the, um, the same thing ended up happening with women until the women's suffragist movement. And eerily enough, if you were to juxtapose the, the conflict of identities, the conflict of indigenous uh, engagement with how we think about production of value, and above all, um, the role of art in giving people a better sense of how we can make a new world, that's where I think the Black Arts Movement is really a powerful thought tool. Um, and from my perspective, here we are, we're 2023. We're, we're like at Weimar Republic, Germany, right at the edge you know, of World War II, fascism, racism, uh, anti-Semitism, pretty much every possible right-wing fever dream is like in full effect. And eerily enough, there's these, all these authoritarian regimes kicking in, whether you're in Turkey, Russia, Italy, um, the authoritarians fear the future. And that is where this, things get complicated. Hi, sir, that's a private. I'm, but, um, Sorry, I'm in a, I'm in the garden here, and so people are just, they see they see the door open and they're about to go in. I'm like, excuse me, that's my house. I'm like, <laughs> I'm very public person, so there we go. Um, but uh, authoritarians fear complexity, and this is a complex time. It's not going to get simple. Um, in fact, it's going to get more and more complex because climate change is kicking in. You're going to be seeing climate refugees, which is going to destabilize all these uh, borders. Uh, Italy obviously is experiencing that. So, so uh, there's a there's a baby or something going. Oh, okay. Well, to make a long story short, I hope that answered your question. Uh, it's complicated. It's not getting simple. And uh, buckle up, because <laughs> it's definitely going. To, Thank you. I, I'm sipping on some uh, fresh kale and wheatgrass this morning. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. We we have we one have... other. If you take one other question, and then um, or it looks like we've got two other. If we guys can make them sort of quick, and then yeah. we'll we'll move to be young. We also have one comment or question um, hand up raised by Honey Crawford. Okay, let's um let's have one here, and then we will go to the, in the room. Yes, I tried in English. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, I'm Annalisa. Um, you talked about supermodels that it's important to know, but I would like to ask you, what do you think about the model proposed through new medias like TikTok, Instagram, usually got by ordinary people, common people, that may don't have access to those discussions or debates that we have, that we are lucky to, to have, and not all about blackness or Above all, for um, uh, the you propose uh, women's uh, women um, models, uh, so women inside of these new medias. That's my question. Okay, um, I think let me answer what I think I'm hearing is, which is, you know, the most destabilizing thing for authoritarian regimes is complexity. So you, they usually offer a very reductionist model. 
So if you have black people over here, white people over here, that's easier to control. It's very reductionist, very easy to, to lock down. But once it starts getting complicated, you know, they, they fear that. So to me, um, one of the most powerful tools we have is this uh, embrace of humanism. And um, that means pan-humanist because we're all people on this planet and the planet is on fire. And we can be arguing and bickering and Putin can invade Ukraine or, you know, whatever. But the planet will be here. We won't be, you know. So it's kind of a crazy moment because the, the Anthropocene era that we're living in, it's, it's very clear. Like the, if the planet is getting sick of us, which it kind of is, I mean, you can see forest fires, droughts, everything. Um, it won't matter if you have black skin or white skin if you're on a dead planet. Well, well, actually, the planet won't be dead, but the conditions for our species to live will have shifted and will be extinct, you know. So um, that's that's kind of where I think capitalism is leading us right now. But on the other end of the spectrum, um, the reductionist model of capitalism thrives on separating people into these ethnic groups, political blocks, and so on. Um, and in fact, if you got rid of all borders on the planet, by the way, global GDP would go up by trillions. We'd have much more creative interaction with people all over the world. Um, the borders are still a legacy of, again, mostly European colonial. You know, if you look at the Sykes-Picot Treaty that drew the Middle East, you look at most of the borders of Africa, most of the borders of, of Asia, they were set up by stuff like the British East India Company or French uh, corporations, Dutch East India Company. Even the stock market is basically the Dutch East India Company. You know, um, so these are all things that are still the legacy of, to me, very crude, very, you know, simple things, but they make billions or trillions of dollars off of the simplicity of it. So to answer the second part of your question, we live in an attention economy. Uh, these platforms you were talking about, TikTok, Instagram, they make money by the more you're on their platform. So the problem with democracy is that they, the crazier stuff that people say, the more clicks and likes they get because more and more people get into that and it's a feedback loop that the algorithms essentially um, up, you know, they kind of uh, up tag, so to speak. So eerily enough, the crazier and crazier you get, the more and more followers you get. Like look at Trump, uh, he would be considered a clown if there was no social media. He would be a barking home, you know, lunatic in the middle of Times Square without social media. I can't imagine if there was no Trump, I'm sorry, if there's no Twitter, we would not have had Trump. TikTok, uh, again, Facebook, you might as well just have a t-shirt saying it's all evil. <laughs> but um, in fact, you know what? I will make a t-shirt saying it's all evil. Um, but, you know, it's, the thing is, how do we, these are attention engines, they're addiction engines. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's studies that have shown, and whoever's there, if you just Google uh, human brain addiction and then showing uh, the model of a human brain versus um, who's someone who's addicted to opium, heroin, it's the same as someone who's addicted to social media. The actual, you can see the folds of the brain, synapses and so on. It's eerie because they've done studies that show that social media addiction is literally changes your brain. So the people who make these, they don't let their kids get on these platforms. Are you kidding? If you're a billionaire and Jeff Bezos' kids are not on Facebook. <laughs> um, you know, so it's kind of a wild thing because they, they know, there's studies that show, study after study, so social media addiction leads to isolation, in Japan, for example, or Korea are the very highly advanced Asian economies. They have to, um, even in China now, they have a thing where you're only allowed to be on your computer a certain amount of time. Because literally, I mean, in Japan, they've had a high suicide rate. Same with Korea, depression. So the more people are on these platforms, the more they get looped into it and they go down a rabbit hole. Um, and these are very advanced economies, but they're able to do psychoanalytic studies that show that the platforms literally are reconfiguring your neural synapses and again, there's plenty of articles online. Uh, so I hope that answered your question. Um, uh, from my perspective, yeah. That's, All right, we're going to uh, take the yeah. one from the um, from the virtual group. Um, so one bet, more I, call, and then we'll I, yeah. move. I guess you could say hashtag delete yourself. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Um, so I'll try to make this quick, but, uh, you know, you're pointing to this, expansive understanding of the black arts movement or expansive approach to black radical movements, how we sort of define and conceive them even. And I was really jazzed by, um, I've known this, but I've never bothered to think about this, that the, the software that you mentioned Ubuntu shares a name with the Bantu philosophy, Ubuntu of humanity, 
which is roughly translated as I am because we are, um, which is a lot more popular in South America and the Caribbean than it is in the United States, um, which makes me think about how you um, position these ideas to the most broad notions of Black being. So for example, um, thinking of um, the anxieties that, that we all are feeling, especially in academia, around artificial intelligence and what some of the implications or maybe optimistic, more optimistically, the generative possibilities um, might be for, you know, um, just Black ontological understanding of Black being. Um, in a moment where artificial existence and intelligence and um, modes of creation are, um, are so like immediately on the cusp. Well, I mean, it, it, the eerie thing is the most feared thing in America is a black person walking down the street. It's really wild because if you look at, um, there was an art, you know, Andre Breton had this, uh, he said the surrealism is someone taking a gun and walking into a crowd and shooting. I don't know if you, it's a very famous phrase about uh, the origins of surrealism. Um, eerily enough, here we are, there's been a mass shooting every day in America across the spectrum. Generally, usually it's a, um, a very alienated white male or, you know, I would say statistically speaking, the predominant amount of that. Um, <clears throat> With the occasional in, in Tennessee, there was a, a woman who was a transgender woman who shot uh, a school. I mean, eerily enough, um, blackness destabilizes the American narrative, but also helps reinforce it personally. Because here's why: because the categories are allowing people to make billions and billions of dollars. And if you create or you, you get rid of those silos, get rid of that. Uh, again, this border. I mean, I'm a globalist. I know that for right wing Republicans, that would make their bur their head burst into flames. But um, to get out of the vice grip of this kind of nation state uh, borders and so on. I mean, it's 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 incredible because African America is a diaspora, much like again Jewish culture is a diaspora. Um, when you start to think about people who've been migrants, immigrants, um, refugees. Those are the people who carry the seeds of all these potentialities. And they're, they're, they're people who, like Darwin would say, it's not the fastest or strongest that survive. He, Darwin tends to get re, uh, misquoted quite a bit, but he would just say, it's not the fastest or strongest that survives, but the one that's most adaptable to change. So someone who's a refugee, an immigrant, who moves, uh, a diaspora, those are places where uh, potentialities of new societies, new places can go. And the mix, you know, mix mixing cultures, mixing uh, everything is a remix. Um, that destabilizes those categories. And um, I kind of celebrate that, but I'm also, if we just take it to its logical path, artificial intelligence, amusingly, if there was a debate a little while ago between Larry Page, who's one of the founders of Google, and um, Elon Musk, who I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not really a fan, I'm not against him or anything. I don't, I just think Elon Musk has, you know, I, I can't stand Twitter. But, um, you know, he said they had a debate because Elon Musk has been asking people to limit AI. And it's not going to happen once it's out of the bag, the cat is out of the bag. But um, and Larry Page is like, yeah, we it's like we're arguing with the wind. I mean, th at this point, the evolution of data and information almost leads towards artificial intelligence pretty much at every level. So that's where someone like Octavia Butler, who's a legendary writer, a lot of her books are about species being mixed or like Lil Lilith's Brood, which is a great um, trilogy, you know. Um, you know, her books really destabilized and were kind of scary because the aliens will take our DNA or do stuff. And it, but there's always this implicit unease and uncanny relationship between her, her main characters and the biological circumstances they find themselves under. Um, I call it biological surrealism. But uh, to go to the heart of your question, blackness is a place of potentiality, and it can be anything. So why limit it? That's kind of my. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, and we're going to move okay. to the next session with the educator. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay. Um, all right, all right. Bye, you guys. So, Romy, I'm going to sign off. And um, okay. Thank, thank you. We'll guys too, we'll see you in a few days. I think about the the mix or something, the music right. mix, right? right?
on Friday. Yeah. Um, so, I just want to say, Romy, thanks again for convening this. It's an absolute pleasure to see you do your thing. Okay. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye, you um, guys. And we are going to move, thank you, we're going to move into another another space with um, faculty B. Young, who's, you know, uh, really just one of these these pioneers in um, the, the area of diversity and equity. And I don't even like, again, we've been talking about in troubling terms, terms that are, are current in the moment. I don't even know if, 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 if Professor Young would use diversity and equity. She was just doing the work in the 60s and the 70s, um, but in the, the education sector. And so, so again, I think that there's some troubling of some of these, these terms and these phrases and these ways that, that we're moving these ideas through contemporary uh, institutions, cultural and, and academic, and, um, and, and, and B. Young has, I think, something to say about that as well. So, B. B, you're muted. See the top bar uh, and right next to the next to the camera button. Uh, yeah, she has the microphone off. Um, so I think, um, are you able to unmute Dio or Lashonda from your end? No. Okay. No. So, oh, I think you made. There we go. It. There we go. Are we okay? Yeah, perfect, yes. perfect, thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Romy, for making this incredible learning experience available across the ocean. Um, I also want to thank Dio and Lashanda for all their talents. I would... Myself in context here, I'm looking out a window, um, a big window in my apartment. And on one side, I see the entire University of Chicago campus. And directly in front of me, I see the construction site for Obama's library. And then to the left, I see the Museum of Science and Industry that was created in 1893 as a part of the world exposition and beyond that is Lake Michigan. So Milan, welcome to Chicago. Uh, I also just want to sort of make a link here. I, I've been studying also uh, the, the wonderful talk that was given earlier this morning and found a new book by Odom Getachew in which he says that new black internationalism examines how the movement for black lives has developed an incipient international language and vision with the potential to remap America's place in the world. And that's a newly released book by a professor at my University of Chicago. So uh, next, and you'll see on my first slide, it's hard to go back that many years, but after graduating from the University of Chicago, it truly became my destiny to become a black history and a race and education advocate. And I truly believe that education, which is my role, uh, is also an art particularly equitable education. So the next slide will be another uh, transition. Yesterday, the word Rainbow Coalition appeared and was talked about a lot. And I wanted to show you, this is a picture of a jazz party in my apartment building here with none other than the origin of our Chicago Coalition. There's another one, Dio, that shows a, a sort of a rainbow. My husband, the woman that runs our building, and the jazz group, we all gathered. So there is Reverend Jesse Jackson for all of Milan to see. So next one. So I am basically talking about a rainbow and racial coalition building 
uh, and I'm going to use examples from the 60s, which I think Romy meant when she said, I was doing a, almost all of this before it had a name. I was just doing the work. And then we'll talk about some equity frameworks. Next one, Theo. Yeah. Thank you. So here's my rainbow uh, and encircling the world. And this is how I see my work in education. And we focus everything on race. So it's important to define truly what are we talking about? It's simply the larger and most recent arbitrary groupings of humankind by shared physical characteristics, which you can read here. And of course, we know through all of this work that certain physical characteristics for groups and individuals create advantages and privileges and others present great disadvantages based on the dominant cultural norms and values. And we've done a lot of talking about what those are right now. The next one. So in my work, we look at race, but we also look at ethnicity. So I asked the question, can we build rainbow coalitions in all areas? So when we look at ethnicity, we're really looking at the way cultures identify how they live. We know, we hear always, well, this is how we do things here. And we hear it in education, which is why many of our Black and Latinx students never are doing what they do there. Next one, please. So in my work, I use a very old, very familiar concept with the iceberg because truly most people make their decisions about others, particularly teachers toward their students with what they assume on the top of that iceberg. And so we attempt to help them lower that waterline so they can actually understand across cultures the nature of friendship or different values or body languages uh, i have a friend of of 50 some years who has always called me her bestie but that's not language i lose i call her my best friend so we get this combination of differences and often then make assumptions rather than lower the waterline and truly understand the way other people look at the world. We all benefit when we expand to understand others' cultural ways. Sometimes we have to negotiate and see that that way really makes sense in a particular situation. But in school districts, with most of the teachers, white teachers, they make many, many assumptions about what's under the waterline and hardly ever lower it. Next one, Dio. So this is a slide, which is a puzzle, but for me, it's not a puzzle. It's not difficult. Cultural responsiveness is what is missing in our schools. And it's not just about adding another cultural reference. It's really about listening and understanding others' cultural lens. I found myself doing that throughout all of the presentations yesterday and today, because being that we're looking across the ocean for this session, it's important that, that, we, that we take that in and learn all we can from those differences. And the next one, so one of the models I use in my work in education, and particularly equity, is a continuum. And we go from, we notice we have arrows on both ends, because sometimes we can be toward the right side and, and then fall back into a maybe even destruction. And in this country, we've, we've 
we have a lot of opportunities to hear and see and experience destructive. Uh, we have a governor in Florida who passed a law that, uh, that requires teachers to never teach anything that makes white students uncomfortable. That makes white students uncomfortable. That's just one new example. And then the next step, of course, is when we hear, but I treat everybody the same. Um, Melody Hobson did a beautiful TED talk, and she talked about getting from colorblind to, to color brave. So I want to attribute the color brave to Melody. She happens to be the wife of George Lucas of Star Wars and herself one of the leading black women executives in this country. So some people move from sameness, understand that saying, I see everyone the same, but they get to tolerance. And you feel like a black student feels like I'll never belong here. I keep hearing I'm just not fitting in, where they don't even hear the words. They feel that sense of not fitting in, not, not uh, being celebrated. One of my clients coined the phrase, we have to teach these students to go where they're celebrated, not where they're tolerated. And we try to, to erase the toleration from those systems. And then we, we get to um, Black History Month. We get to acceptance and celebration. It's a step. It's a good step. But the reality is we need to get to that high point of valuing the differences, becoming color brave. So I want to just ask three questions. Where do you think you are as an individual on this continuum right now, as you look at valuing differences? How about the organizations you're engaged in? Where are they? I spent 20 years helping major thousands of corporations across this country look at how culturally responsive they are and they're on all these steps and then finally what can we do about it what what can we do and where do you think you are now and where do you want to be so i just i have you think about those questions. The next one, Dio. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about my experience in Rainbow Coalition building long before I met Reverend Jackson and long before even the word Rainbow Coalition building was uh, utilized. Next one, Dio. There we go. So one of the first Rainbow Coalitions I'm proud to have created was called the Amstad Society. I graduated from the university for the first time in 1960 and went on to be a high school history teacher, particularly on the south side of Chicago, which is where I am now, uh, in an all-black school. And I prepared myself by borrowing the textbooks, the history textbooks. And there were nothing but lies, distortions, and all omissions. Anything that was said about blacks or slavery was demeaning, disgusting. And I worked with many other high school teachers and, um, and then met my colleague here, Dr. Sterling Stuckey. Sterling was then a high school history teacher, like was I. And we decided to create an organization and we called it the Amistad Society. I'll tell you in a minute what that means. And then we helped students who became aware of what we were doing and trying to change the textbooks. And they began to pick it, the Board of Education in Chicago to replace those textbooks. What I did with the textbooks when I first entered in 1960, an all black high school 
on the west side of Chicago, we had a burial. We placed each book very carefully into a closet. And then I had, I borrowed huge um, tape, tape recorders from friends and asked my students to interview parents, aunts, uncles, their pastors, anybody who they thought would know more about the real history. And we together wrote our own history. In fact, their book was placed on exhibition at the Emancipation Centennial in, in 1963. So Sterling went on to become one of the most uh, revered authors, a scholar, has written many, many books. He has really become a legacy to other historians, particularly white historians, so you see many books based on Sterling's work to change that text. And indeed, now black history is a requirement in Illinois schools. Amasad Society lasted well into the middle of the 70s. Sterling and I wrote a book now still unpublished because we went on to many other things. But I'm proud of that Rainbow Coalition. And we had educators across Chicago uh, joining us and bringing in from New York, from California. We had Malcolm X as a, a speaker in, in churches on the south side of Chicago, filled with people wanting to know more in the 1960s. And the next one, Leo. <clears throat> and again, this is the 60s. Uh, because of our work with Amistad, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, asked us to help write the curriculum for the Freedom Schools in 1964. And we based it on this wonderful story of the Amistad slave revolt, which I'm going to share <clears throat> just uh, very briefly. But it was such an important historical event that it prefaced the um, curriculum for the Freedom Schools. The Amistad slave ship revolt occurred off the coast of Cuba in 1839. The rebellion involved 53 African slaves who had been abducted from Sierra Leone by Spanish slavers who shipped what they called their cargo, which were human beings called Africans. And the slaves were put in a slave auction in Cuba and then transferred to a Spanish-owned schooner called La Amistad, which ironically means friendship. The leader of this rebellion was known as Senk, a 26-year-old man a slave then from Sierra Leone. The slaves seized control of the ship, killing most of the crew, and ordered the navigator to sail back to Africa. The navigator, however, um, duped the slaves, and the Amistad slave ship was intercepted two months later off the coast of New York. Then the abolitionists were very active at that time, demanded, the, particularly the abolitionists on the East Coast, demanded that a trial take place. And believe it or not, the defending counsel of the surviving 35 slaves took the Amistad case, and that was John Quincy Adams, our sixth president. And donations from abolitionist movement across the country helped 35 slaves, Africans, return to Sierra Leone in 1842. So it embeds so much about the real history of Blacks in this country. I spent that summer in 64 helping to implement the curriculum. The photo is an example of one of the freedom schools held mostly in churches. I supported SNCC workers 
and like almost every SNCC worker, ended up in jail day after day, which were demeaning behaviors that black Mississippians experienced all the time. Next one, my final one of the 60s. In uh, Illinois in 1948, the legislature created the Illinois Commission on Human Relations and, and created in 1948 to help um, end discrimination across the state in whatever forms. But 20 years later, the, the uh, then executive director, Nostea, that is in the center of this photo, Roger Nathan, um, got funds to create an education services department in 1965. I was offered the job, they interviewed many, but Roger, the executive, had seen me present a play about black history that was presented across the city to various high schools. The play was entitled, I Too Sing America, borrowed from Langston Hughes' very famous poem and the students memorized the, all the roles in this play I wrote. And uh, it was that experience that invited me to become the director of that uh, education services department. The man on the right is Ben Williams. He uh, died very recently. He became my co-chair he was then a high school, rare high school black principal in Illinois and went on to become a, a leader in education. And the nun was on the board appointed by the governor and watched our presentations of our work across the state and asked if, if she quit her presidency of St. Xavier's College, could she join my team? And she did. You can see if, if you look carefully at my breasts, I'm nine months pregnant in this particular photograph, still working. So my son is today 55 years old. He's named after his father, Charlie, but he's also, he, he is now Charlie Dubois Douglas Young. So the role we played here was to go across the straight the state uh, desegregating uh, schools everywhere there were separate schools in our in this state and nobody wanted us that was white we were picketed everywhere we went and it was a law we were following but we had a lot of grit and determination in taking on the battle that ensued every time we came in to a school district. Um, but what we did was to create structured, systemic, and sustainable plans. We didn't just bring help bring black students and white students together. We created educational plans that ultimately became the foundation for what we today call educational equity, which is where I believe uh, Romy gets the title she imbues. So the next one, please, Dio. And this is part of the Illinois Commission team, my education services group. You'll recognize Ben and Sister Betty and Roger. And this is at the wedding of one of our colleagues who is Orthodox Jewish. And you'll notice that all the men are wearing yarmulkes, which are required. This is that I was in that role from 65 to 1974. And Harold, Harold Goldberg, whose wedding we were attended, and I have just written a book called Boots on the Ground about the 10 years that we were integrating Illinois School District. Next one. So a little bit about what it takes to achieve educational equity. Deal? So 
the way I look at organizations and my team as well is that we have to look backward to inform a path forward. And knowing that black history, and which where I've been dedicated to for all these 60 years, uh, we know that the discrimination against people of color and other marginalized groups has been persistent, pervasive, and unrelenting. So how do we come in and, and create an organization that systems will support black students and Latinx students? In fact, in 1966, a professor from Harvard, Professor Coleman, wrote a report and actually documented the separation, the disadvantages, the bias against black students versus white students and published a report that was well known back then. We never hear about it today, very, very seldom. And he, he said, these facts are true. We must do something to change them. And uh, from my perspective, now having done this educational equity work for all these decades even today equity remains a goal not a reality for most school districts and i believe that it can only be achieved when there is a focus on racial consciousness and cultural responsiveness which will ultimately create inclusion and belonging so students feel they fit in their school there's just uh, two more uh, Gio. Uh, this is a model I created several decades ago. And any kind of systemic effort is always a journey. Most of the superintendents that invite my team in to do the work think it's a quick fix, but it, it, it is not a quick fix, but it can. As my first book called Restoring the soul to education written with dr carmen ayala who just finished her four years as the state superintendent and left a legacy of equity requirements she was the superintendent of the school district when we wrote this book along with uh, my business partner if you notice on this model the the leaders are in the center when I use this with corporations, their, their boards, their executives were in the center. They would be the ones that would invite us and commit to the action. And at the top of that model, you'll see the word cultural audit, we sometimes call it an equity audit, where we go into the organization, and now in this case, the schools. We, interview all the leaders including the um, elected board of education members of whom there are seven in illinois many of whom are not educators and represent many different political views of the community they're serving and we go in and my team which is a rainbow team black white latinx asian Muslim, of all hues, uh, we do focus groups of 10 to 12 participants separately by race. So my black colleague does the focus groups of teachers, of whom there are few in most Illinois schools, uh, support staff, where there are more, much more diversity and they often have some of the best responses of students separated by race and parents. And we put together a report, everyone's uh, words and thoughts and experiences are anonymous, but we put together a report providing the leaders with recommendations to move forward, but still recognizing what what's going on and they hear the words in, in developed into themes 
of what needs to be changed to create an equitable organization, one that every student can absolutely know they will and can succeed to their best efforts. And then the rest of the model, say having that data, they now can integrate those learnings into their systems, the system of discipline, the system of hiring, all the systems that make it the curriculum, which even though we have a law to include uh, black history and Latinx history and just this month, uh, Native American history, it's not truly systemic in the organizations. And then they can provide education knowing what the educators and leaders need, uh, usually creating rainbow coalitions which have both students uh, and parents as members and often co-leaders. And the final one, with what I've been saying, I think the best way to summarize my energy, my anger, my, my 90 years of devotion to Rainbow Coalitions is through James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor B. Young. You know, we started this morning today with um, with anger and with articulations of anger and pain and trauma and yeah. tears. And um, I I think it's really poignant that you end reminding us that that a lot of this is fueled by anger. Um, I also think it's so important that that the, the, the amazing point you made just a few moments about the the, the duration that it's a journey that these are not quick fixes. I think this is something that I've absolutely learned from some of you faculty in the BAM school that um, that just have a perspective that 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 helps us to know that we're we're not going to probably do this in 50 years, you know. It yeah. but to be be open to the exploration and the process is 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 uh, just as important. So so thank you. And, and build build for the future. Build for train the future. others to follow. Exactly, exactly. What so, you're doing um, with those wonderful people, Dio and Sandra. Uh, yeah. So we have, uh, think, think time for a couple of questions or comments. Is there anything either from the virtual context or people in the room? Anything on your end, Dio? Oh, we do have something. Just a moment, B. Mm -hmm. Is that one? Maybe that one doesn't work. We'll leave, we'll leave it. We'll use the same microphone. Hi, can you see me? Is that? Yeah, yeah? cool. Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, what am I trying to say? Do you have any practical tips in terms of passing the baton on, you know, you just said, right, like train others. And I think that's something that I'm finding tricky, like when it's time for me to step away because I need to do other things with my life. Sometimes I haven't done that work to pass the baton on. And so then there's this gap and people are like, thank you so much for your work. And then there's nothing. And so just, I'm just wondering, you know, as an educator, just kind of like, how do you give people the tools so that they can, you know, um, yeah, help other yeah. people <laughs> to continue yeah. the work so we're not, each one of us not burdened with yes. the responsibility of stewardship, um, uh, all, all, an unending stewardship. Yeah. Well, it seems to me you have been probably building others in your work. Are you an educator? Yes. Yes, I figured. So think about those 
students, other educators, other leaders that you've worked with. And in, in my work, when I find a jewel, somebody who has the energy, the commitment, I just uh, find myself almost unconsciously uh, sharing whatever I can, inviting them to join me, uh, introducing them to the right people, uh, just helping constantly. It's almost a daily experience without even thinking about it that you need to have others continuing your work. And you, I bet you do it already. And if, and if you're leaving, leave for another good reason to really basically continue the work that Romy and others are doing with BAM and, and other coalitions. Uh, but frankly, I'm, I'm turning 90 in July and I still have plenty of energy and ability to continue this work. And there, I think there are probably uh, dozens of people out there in, in, um, who went on to found black history uh, departments and universities across the country who are now superintendents of other school districts that have either been in my classes or part of my team. Right now, with every member of my team are people I've worked with over the years, and they're ready to take it over, but I still have energy to do it. So call me. I'll, I'll be glad to talk more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're you welcome. know, I think that's such a great point because we were, you know, if we think about Stefano Harney's comments earlier and something we talked about yesterday, systemic, again, the language of systemic change has us to think that that only those big system wide changes that happen in a year or something are real and and actually they can these shifts can happen in very intimate ways. Yes. with people that you know in a very local way and um and that those those interventions matter and are really productive even though this other type of, of change might take 50 years or more or never never happen well i think we have to always be working on the personal level and the organizational level and thinking in both ways how we can make a difference yeah. okay is there anything else any other oh Okay, you've got two more that are in the room, oh my and then um, and then we have to wrap up soon. We we keep closing down the museum. <laughs> the museum closes soon. <laughs> All right. You, you have something from um. Oh, lost oh time. I know who that is. Uh, <laughs> hey, Benny. Yeah. Hi. Um, you know, I was an artist in resident at the Hyde Park Art Center, and a group yes. of. Uh, professors were invited to come by and talk. And one of the things that they were concerned with, the relationships between students and, and faculty. Yep. And I had read an article in the Maroon that they were at one point even suggesting that they have a budget available so that professors and students could go out and have dinner and kind of get to know one another. And I know in my case, if it hadn't been for uh, Grace Earl at the Art Institute, I would not be sitting here where I am. Yes. So you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, that's my university. I, I learned a lot there, but the reality is I, I can't imagine the number of, of, of friends, students, colleagues that I didn't count on a grant to take out to dinner and talk about their future or how I might be able to help them. I would actually in the in late 50s when I graduated in 60 with my first degree, I had a, one a professor in particular who took me under his wing and, uh, and that made a difference in my life. Mm -hmm. I hate to think that that wasn't happening for, for the rest of the 60 years of my, of my life uh i know you've done it you you've mentored many many people Absolutely. i think it's a life's work mm -hmm. 
but I, I, I want to come over and, and see that beautiful Rainbow Coalition over there at the Art Center. All right, looking forward to seeing you sometime. Uh, likewise. Thank you. Um, and I think there was one other, one other comment or question for you. It will be just a quick note. Um, your camera is facing, the, facing your window. Oh, it is? Yeah. Can I We'd love it? to see your face, but the giraffes look amazing as well. <laughs> but the what is amazing? The giraffe. So if you wanted to put it, um, they to flip see the anything. camera around, but no, but no problem if not. Oh, it's all over, and I didn't know that. Oh, well, sí. I have a Adesso whole... sono proprio un po' confusa, non so dove guardare, dove parlare perché ho anche gli auricolari. Oh, I see that. What would have caused that? Vabbè, comunque, e grazie per il suo intervento, la prima cosa. Poi <laughs> Allora, e Calua, sono una afro-latina. Yeah, I see the giraffe now. E, e questo vuol dire che la mia identità è composta dalla tradizione coloniale spagnola e africana. Sono un'attrice e ho fatto anche l'insegnante a Cuba all'interno delle scuole d'arte. E, e niente, e sono cresciuta in un'educazione dove tutti eravamo uguali. Oggi come oggi, e dopo dieci anni in Italia, mi dico no dovevano farmi imparare la cultura della diversità, non quella della igualdad, parlando in spagnolo. E la mia domanda, affermazione, e tutto questo miscuglio che adesso ho in testa parte da le connessioni tra un sistema di potere, come si costruisce un piano formativo per la istruzione dentro delle scuole, che rapporto esiste tra le pratiche vive, artistiche, culturali di un'arte un nero, di una nerezza artistica, e insomma capire che tipo di consiglio, di proposte, ecco, connessioni tra questi termini. Politica culturale di un paese, piano formativo delle accademie d'arte o dell'accademia in modo generale, e come portare anche la realtà, il background, cioè il, il lavoro dell'arte che si fa anche nelle strade, l'attivismo, e costruire un discorso, una relazione unica di dialogo come sinonimo di cambiamento tra tutti questi aspetti. Non so se la traduzione sarà anche <ride> quella. Can we summarize that? Yeah. Okay. I'm Afro-Latin and I'm an actress and I taught uh, art in schools in Cuba um, and I'm an educator and uh, in Cuba we were all equal. Now that I'm here, I think that I, they should have taught me the culture of diversity instead of the culture of equality. So how do you bring it's possible to promote uh, um, a cultural offer in art school and to bring activism to promote change. I hope. Mm. I hope I summarized because she made various questions. Uh, I don't know if I told all of them, but I think more or less. Sì, esatto. I, relationships paese. with the uh, poli cultural. Pol uh, policy of a, of a country and uh, academia. Well, one of the um, speakers talked about both the equality of race, perhaps, but how about uh, economy? How about income? Uh, how about regions? So all those are aspects of diversity. So how are people marginalized, even in uh, in, in, an, in a district or a, a school or country where the color feels equal? But what what are the what are the ways in which people feel different, feel they don't belong? 
and to actually utilize the same approach of identifying uh, groups that feel mar marginalized and having somebody they can trust that's from the similar background interview them so we can share that data to make the systems work even more effectively. Is that, is that responding? Whatever you, even though I wasn't understanding you, it sounded beautiful. <laughs> it really did. And it's a great question. Sì, ampia secondo me e forse la risposta era anche c'è cioè, data dalle persone che si occupano anche della, cioè, di costruire tutta questa politica culturale no? che da lì è data la mia identità che è proprio trasversale da una politica culturale a una politica anche eh, di quello che succede all'interno delle scuole e un po' da lì parte la mia, le, le mie interrogazioni però Va bene, ci sarà anche un altro momento, ripeterò anche le, le stesse domande. I'm going to see if I can get a summary for you, B, and then we'll close out. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, your answer um, uh, broached the topic. Uh, my, my question was very, very broad because it has to do with both education and uh, political issues uh, in comparison between my country and uh, uh, Italy. Yes, and and I I would love to to explore it further. Yes, right. I think one of the things we've learned from this particular session is is about uh, specificity and and sort of the absolute need for specificity. But at the same time, we could start marking out and mapping um, how we can do this work and speak to each other. Um, when we when we don't have the specific knowledge and information. So we can kind of keep two sort of lanes of, of discourse going, one which is about the absolute need for specificity, and then another which allows us to, to find some common ground just the same. So Yes, and that's what I would love to be able to have with the woman that asked that question. Is right, so one of the... Right, so we're closing out, but one of the things we can do is we can gather some questions and then uh, maybe share some of these via email um, and be in touch with each other from this point on. So that's what we'll do. I okay. love that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And thank you so much, Dio and Lashanda and everyone who's there today virtually, and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, thank you.